Appreciate right. it. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of History Lessons. I have the guest in the building. His name is Kid Sensation. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. What's good? What's good? Let's take it back all the way to the beginning and work our way up to what you have going on in 2023. But for those who may have never uh, known where Kid Sensation was born and raised, take us back. Born and raised in Seattle, Washington, representing them Seahawks, man. You already know. All um, right. Yes, sir, man. Raised in the Seattle streets, man. Um, 100% uh, Seattle born, man. Seattle bred. Dope. Take us back to a day in the life, kid sensation, teenage years, growing up in Seattle. <laughs> wow, wow. So um, Seattle was kind of one of them cities, man, that, you know, there was a lot more than what I guess kind of meet the eye or, you know, that it, it kind of had more than the reputation kind of afforded it. Like a lot of people, you know, when they heard we were from Seattle, were more like, man, do they wear shoes up there, man? Is there anything up there even in Seattle? But a lot of people don't know, man. Seattle got a lot going on, man. Like uh, Microsoft headquarters is up there. Amazon, you know, all kind of, you know, big things is happening in Seattle, man. We technology technologically dope. And, um, you know, as but as in, in the when I was growing up, man, you know, we um, were kind of considered West Coast because we're on the West Coast. But yet. People slept on us being like West Coast. We just kind of we were just kind of up in our little corner in the part there. So when you think West Coast, you always think of Cali, you think of L.A., Oakland, all the uh, people from uh, uh, from California. But Seattle was never kind of really like uh, kind of involved or included in that whole thing, man. So um, it was it was great coming from the city. It was great uh, having our own our own flow, our own style, our own um, kind of niche. It's um, it's a bigger city than most people think of, man. We got the Space Needle. I don't know if you ever seen the Seattle skyline, man, but we got some really dope uh, tall buildings, man. Um, the uh, World Trade Center that's in Seattle, man, is one of the tallest buildings on the West Coast, or it was, you know, for a number of years. And, you know, well, well over 100 and something floors, man. And, uh, you know, of course, we got all the major sports. Well, until somebody stole our Sonics, but we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> We'll leave that as another subject, but you know we got our our hockey, we got our uh, our cracking man. They did real good this year. Um, we got our uh, our Mariners, of course, and my man Ken Griffey Jr. And each row, shout out to those guys. And then of course um, we have our Seahawks, man, who you know we represent. So, man, our city is uh, our city is doing things, man. We got a lot. We got a lot going on. Can't forget about the late great Jimi Hendrix as well. 100%, man. Come on, Quincy Jones. The Q is from Seattle, man. And so we have a lot really popping off, man. And um, and growing up there, man, it was just a, uh, a, it was a very diverse music scene, man. There was a lot of good local artists and good local music. There was uh, a lot of dope, you know, bands and dope, you know, just entertainers, man. And uh, a lot of actors, a lot of all kind of people, man, that came from our city that people just had no idea of, you know what I mean? It produced, you know, Bill Gates, man, one of the richest men in the world, you know, Seattle, man, we got some things popping off. Right. Before uh, diving into music yourself, who were some of your early influences? Oh, wow. Good question. Good question. Man, um, when, it, when it came to influence, before I really started to even get into the music, I was always intrigued by people who achieved in, 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 in business and people who achieved and had their own thing. So a lot of time, you know, it wasn't even famous people, man. It was a lot of times like my doctor, you know what I mean? I'd be like, man, how did he have his own practice and his own thing, you know, kind of going on for himself? Or I'd be in, in or like, you know, the guy who had a detail shop, I'd be like, man, wow, that's kind of cool. He owns this whole car wash and he owns, you know, all of this, and he's got all these people working for him, man, and everybody's doing a thing, or, you know, I was influenced by a lot of people who were just business-minded, man, and that had their own thing going on, and I learned that at an early age, man. I know it sounds crazy, but I, when I was 11 years old, I used to work for this lady who had a jeans stand. Like, she sold jeans to men, women, whatever the case is, and I used to go up there, and I used to work for her, and I would help to sell the jeans, man, and, um, I was only 11 years old, man, but I was really intrigued by the fact that this lady could pull up in her little pickup truck, set up her tents, hang these jeans out, man, and be and money hand over fist coming in. She's selling 10, 15 bucks a pair, whatever, but she's ordering them. She's getting them at a certain price. 
And then she's selling them at a little more of a price. She was able to even pay me and do all that. So it's like, man, I was always intrigued by people who was in business. So those were kind of my influences, man. Doctors and real estate agents and uh, just entrepreneurs. Right. So uh, you talked a little bit about the music scene earlier on before you were getting out there. Maybe as you were getting out there, who were some of the earlier uh, Seattle artists uh, that was on the scene? Oh, man. Like, especially when you talk hip hop, man, that's just a fun a fun, fun road to go down, man. The Emerald Street Boys, man, was this crew of dudes, man, that I that we so looked up to, man. Um, the Roxy crew, you know, break dancers and MCs, you know, and DJs. And it, it, there was all there was a cool hip hop scene, man. And I'm dating myself, but in the 80s, man, the hip hop was alive and popping in Seattle, man. Rappers like Big Boss Cross and all these different dudes, man, local cats that were just um, making music and literally some of them even put out records and some of them put out, you know, little mixtapes and stuff like that. And it was like early in the game when we just dreamed of even maybe having our stuff like on the radio and things like that, man. And then, you know, you get into the lovesick rhymers, man. You get into um, the uh, Union Street hustlers, man. All these different people, man, that were, you know, and, and, and it's crazy. I tell people this all the time, and I'm not saying this, you know, to embellish anything, man. A lot of those dudes, man, were, were doper than I was back in the day. They was way doper. I just happened to maybe get the, the, the chance or the break. But, man, there were some dope MCs in, uh, in Seattle, bro. Dope, dope, dope to hear that history that I didn't, uh, you know, never knew about in Seattle. Uh, as for you, at what point did you get into music? Did you start off break dancing, graffiti, DJ, sometimes before the MC? You know, you had all those elements. What for Kid Sensation uh, was your first foray into hip hop? Man, all of the above, man. I love the culture and the music so much that I would do anything to just be a part of the culture. So I tried my hand at break dancing and I was decent, you know, pop locking. I would do that, man. I done, I've been a DJ. I was some mixalized DJ for a number of years. Um, I would rap, I would MC, I would DJ parties. I would do anything to just kind of like be around the music. So for me, um, every element of hip hop, other than graffiti, I'm not really artistically all that great, but uh, I love the graffiti. I just wasn't, I, I wasn't the one that was necessarily doing it because I wasn't filthy like that. If I had that skill, I sure would have, man. I used right. to try to draw stuff on paper and I realized, nah, that, you, you, that ain't you, bro. You ain't him. So, right. uh, but other than that, man, every element of hip hop, man, has been one that has been an influence on my life and then a part of, um, of what attracted me to the culture. And I love it all. Right. At what point did you start taking writing serious? Wow. Um, taking it serious. I, I kid you not, man. It was probably around 13 years old, man. Around 13 years old. I really was realizing like what I used to do. And I'm sure you remember how um, a 12 inch single would come and it would have the instrumental. If you flip it over, you got the, the B side that has the instrumental of the song. So no lyrics and you just got the beat. So, man, I would take those a lot of times and rap to the beat, you know, on the flip side of the instrumental, man, and drive my mom crazy, scratching on her uh, her component set with the turntable and all that, messing around. But that was what I would do, man. And so I started to really take the writing seriously because I wanted to be the dopest dude on the block. And the, and I wanted to, to be like, yo, if, we, if I got a battle with this crew or these dudes, man, they're a little older than me, but I want to be ready. And so I started to try to put my rhymes together. And I, man, I, I wanted to be LL Cool J and all these guys so bad, you know, because those dudes was dope back in the day. So, yeah, man, it, I started taking writing seriously around 13. So did you start off with a crew or were you always solo? I was pretty much for the most part solo, man. I mean, like there was dudes that I was always cool with and and dudes that I like to build with, dudes that I'd like to, you know, um, to, to rap with and to, and to hang out with or whatever. But I always kind of wanted to do my thing. and no disrespect to any other person, but it just felt like, you know, I never wanted to be limited by others ideas. And I love collaboration when people are trying to make me better and do whatever. And that works for a lot of crews. For me, it was a thing of when I'm creating a song and I want to really express my vision and my own, you know, it was just kind of like my own journey. So that was where I stayed. Right. Do you remember uh, your demo days? Did you shop a demo? And You, uh, 
you disappeared a little bit there, man, but I'm going to ask you a question about the demo thing. OK, cool. I got you back. Um, as far as uh, demos were concerned, man, um, yes, I did, you know, create demo recordings. And I'm going to tell you, man, how how <laughs> how down I was, man, and how and how my how how much I really wanted to be in the music when I wanted to create a demo. And I like I told you, I would rap to instrumental. I to whatever, and I had little um, toy drum machines and little weird stuff like that. So, man, I would be in my room, man, like a scientist or somebody, man, sit up here, you know, like Jimmy Riggin. I'd take a headphone and I'd rewire the headphone so that I could make a microphone out of it and plug that into, you know, a little primitive mixer, man. And I, you know, record stuff onto just a cassette tape. So it would just be me and a track. And I'd have to, you know, I didn't have no multi-tracks and then I had to take it, do it in one take, do the whole thing and get it right. You know what I mean? All together. And so, um, that, that was, the, that was what I did, man. I, I did that to make little recordings and I'd only play them to myself or maybe a couple people that was close to me to see if people was like, even thinking that I had some sort of talent, I was a little too embarrassed and the quality wasn't good enough to really put them out there. But, um, that was how I started kind of like making demos, man. And then I really actually said, man, forget it. I'm gonna start, you know, saving up my money and scraping and doing whatever I had to do to start buying a little bit of studio equipment. And then I had to mix a lot kind of as a mentor who was all, who already had a pretty elaborate recording studio, man. So, um, and he always, man, like all of his albums, everything that dude always recorded them in his home studio. He very seldom went into a, you know, a, a rented studio to do his thing. And I learned from him that, man, you know, create your, 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 your creative space, man, so that you can be in there. You ain't on nobody's clock and you can just do what you need to do. And so that was kind of how the birth of my demos. Uh, you mentioned Sir Mix a lot. At what point did you uh, meet him? <laughs> man, I was probably about 12, 13, right in that time, man. So he and I lived in the same housing project, man, in South Seattle. It's right near uh, Rainier Beach High School. You ever heard of Rainier Beach High School? I have not. It's uh, it's in South Seattle. It's a very famous high school because it has turned out a big, big number of NBA players. Uh, Jamal Crawford, Doug Christie, uh, Nate Robinson, all these different people. All these guys came from Rainier Beach High School, man. And um, and so it's turned out to, uh, uh, turned in a tremendous number. And even right now, playing for the um, for the uh, Houston Rockets, Kevin Porter Jr. He's from Rainier Beach High School as well. Um, it, that just that one high school, man, has put so many different players in the uh, in the in the league, man. And it's uh, and yeah, so we lived literally right across the street from uh, from Rainier Beach High School. And so so mix a lot live like maybe just a block and a half down from where I live, man. And so we, um, you know, and he used to. A lot of people don't realize this, but Sir mix a -Lot's name came from him being a DJ. And that's why he was called Mix-A-Lot, because he did a lot of mixing and he was a DJ. And so um, he um, he then um, would make mixtapes. And when I say mixtapes, not like your today's definition of a mixtape. He made tapes, cassette tapes with a lot of different songs mixed on there and he'd talk on them and he'd personalize it to you. Yo, Sincere, man, here goes your mixtape. And he like, yeah, my man, Sincere, boom. And he'd play all the newest, freshest cuts. And then rather than you having to go buy a bunch of records, he'd be like, he'd personalize it to you and then he'd give it to you. And then he'd be like, yo, this is your mixtape basically made for you. So you'd have all the freshest and newest cuts and you only had to buy, give him $10 and a brand new tape and boom, he'd hook you up. And so, um, that's how I met him was, you know, I had heard about him doing these mixtapes and I was like, man, rather than me having to go buy all these records, I can just go get all the newest music from him. So let me go see if he can hook me up. And I started, you know, buying my mixtapes from him, man. And then all of a sudden, that was his little hustle. And um, and so we just kind of got cool from that. So what kind of earlier discussions did you guys have as far as uh, teaming up, uh, you know, him mentoring you, uh, giving advice? I mean, you've seen him do his thing earlier on and, and get established, get signed. So uh, what role did you play early on? Well, it's really crazy, man. Like when we met and as we were trying to kind of like, uh, you know, dibble dabble with the music, he would DJ parties. And then he started making his own little homemade songs out of the little beat machines and stuff we would kind of luck up on or whatever. And so um, I would just try to like, be down like man i just trying to ride his coattail anywhere he go man if he was dj at a party i was 13 years old man trying to be at these parties he'd be djing all these grown folks and i'd just be like man can i start the record can i scratch a little can i you know and can i get on the mic can i do anything you know so i would do anything i could to be around the music whenever he was 
you know, doing his thing. And so um, I, I started to we it, it was never really like this conversation that we had, like, yo, man, I'd like to get on or, you know, I'm trying to do this or trying to do that, whatever. It just because we both loved the music and we both were, you know, were, were just in love with the pro- came along with it, man. We just started kind of just doing stuff. And I just kind of got in where, you know, where I could fit in. And I, and, and I was just trying to just be down and be a part of what was happening, man. So it just progressed uh, over time. Uh, before appearing on Swass on the track Ripping, did you have anything materialize? Uh, any records out before that? Yeah, actually. Um, so Ripping was uh, on the Swass album and the Swass album was was Mix's first album, but a lot of people don't know it wasn't his first release. He had several singles that came out um, before um, Swass album made it out. And like Square Dance Rap was one of them. And I had beatboxed on that song. And like I told you, I was trying to do anything to be around the music. Look, I, let's get it, man, <laughs> you know? And, you know, finally I got my chance to get on the mic with Rippin. But, um, he had several releases, man, and I, I would beatbox on them. I would talk in the background. I'd be, oh, whatever, man, I could do to be in the background or whatever, man. I always just wanted to just be around the music and a part of what was going on. And so because um, I knew that if I just kind of kept at it that way, somehow, some way, I, someone was going to give me a chance and give me a break to uh, to kind of get on, you know. Right. What kind of conversation did you have as far as getting on Rip and, uh, you know, how did he approach you? I mean, evidently you paid your dues early on just, uh, yeah. you know, being around him. So how did you uh, land the opportunity to get on that track? Yeah, to get on Rip and, man. That's so funny. So we used to play video games all, t- all the time together, man. So we was playing Super Nintendo, playing Double Dragon and, you know, messing around and whatever the case is. And, and those were the times where he'd all of a sudden just get a wild hair and be like, man, I'm going to make this beat or I'm going to do this or do that. So I just knew, man, if I just hung around him enough, played enough video games, did enough, eventually, man, we're going to find our way in the studio and we're going to do something. So Rippin literally just came about because he was just in the studio playing around. And I think we may have heard that. I think we heard that in something else or whatever. And um, it's like that old Alouetta song or whatever it is. And he was like, man, wouldn't that be dope if we just put that to a, a, a beat or to a track? And we just start playing around in the studio, man. And, um, and you know, a lot of times when people had fast beats like that, they would rap real slow. Like the beats like boom, 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 boom. They'd be like, da, 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 da. You know, they rap in that little slow, you know, but we decided, man, we gonna speed this thing up, man. Let's do something and, and tongue tie it and trip it up a little bit. And, you know, so, we was really, if you really go back and, and research your history, Rippin came out in 1985, 1986, right in there. We was the first wow. ones to rap that fast. Like nobody was tripling up their lyrics and all that kind of stuff. And for us to be, never get ill because I'm too damn small. It's got a funky trans and with the dual eggs. You know, for us to be rapping like that, nobody was rapping that fast. So everybody was bugging off of that, man. And so, uh, you know, I consider us to be kind of, you know, fathers of that style a little bit. A lot of people don't know that, man. A little nugget for you. Absolutely. Fun fact. Uh, after that appearance on Rippin, how did life change for Kid Sensation? <laughs> wow, man. Like, I mean, yeah, it, 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 it got it got it got real and it got real really fast. And I tell people this story a lot. <laughs> it's kind of funny, man. So. I remember the first time when uh, when Square Dance Rap was out and, and, and I was beatboxing for mix, DJing, playing keyboards, whatever, you know, stuff that I could do to, like I said, be on stage and around the music. And I remember he came to my house and he, uh, you know, was talking to my mom and he's, you know, in his 20s, man, I'm 13, 14 year old kid. And he like, yeah, so, um, I, you know, I, I, I think you your son's been telling, you know, you guys have heard this, the music's been on the radio, things are starting to happen with Square Dance Rap, whatever the case is. He said, I, so they, I got invited to come down to uh, down to Alabama and Mississippi and all this to do some shows. And I'd like to take your son along. Now, this is a 20 something year old man, right? <laughs> Coming into the house asking, the, you know, uh, my mom, if, if, she, if, if uh, he could take her, you know, 13, 14 year old kid out, you know, halfway across the country. And, uh, you know, and so my mom looked at him and she looked at me, she looked back at him. And she said, so you mean to tell me that you're going to take my son halfway across the country and he's going to and you're going to give money for it? He was like, yeah. He was like, she was like, 
here, send him. Let's go. Go on. <laughs> go on out there, man. Go do what you got to do. You know, and so so my mom definitely didn't hold me back, man. She she gave me the opportunity to go out there and sort of uh, chase this dream of music, you know, with uh, with with mix, man. And the rest was kind of, you know, history from there. Very dope. Shout out to moms. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So were labels approaching you after your appearance and how did you land at Nasty Mix? Um, so, yeah, man, Nasty Mix, actually, uh, a lot of people don't know this either. A little fun nugget I'm going to give you. Nasty Mix came from the names Nasty Ness. You know who Ness Rodriguez is, Nasty Ness and Mix a lot. So they called it Nasty Mix. They put their names together. So Nasty Mix was birthed not because somebody had a label or were starting a label and wanted to go sign to Max or whatever. Nasty Mix was birthed out of the fact that Sir Mix-a-Lot was having a lot of radio and, you know, live performing success. And there was a demand for his record. People wanted to say, hey, where can we get his music? And so it was birthed out of demand. And so Ed Locke, who was the president of the company, was like, why don't we try pressing up and releasing a record? And so um, it was it was it was kind of beyond our thoughts of actually doing ourselves. We always thought that we'd just keep on keeping on until somebody discovered us or whatever it is. But um, that was birthed out of necessity, man. We just decided to say, you know, we need to do something about the fact that there's a demand. Let's meet this demand and let's go get some records pressed and try to make something happen. Gotcha. You talked a little bit about Mix a Lot grabbing you for shows. What do you remember most about that debut album and the tours that came with it? Uh, <laughs> Sir Mix a Lot's debut album. Before we get to yours, yeah, yeah, wow, man. Some of the uh, some of the acts that we were just on tour with that was the funnest stuff, man. I mean, legendary, amazing, incredible artists, man. I'm talking Public Enemy, you know, MC Hammer, um, Big Daddy Kane. Biz Markey, rest in peace, man, my guy. And side story, man, Biz Markey is one of the funniest dudes, man, you'll ever run across. That dude can rank. Now, you know, if you look like Biz Markey, you better be able to rank, man. And that dude can rank, man. He will, He man, he had mama jokes saved up for us, man. He was flaming everybody on tour, man. You, Biz was somebody you did not pick a rank out with, man. He would, he would get on your head. But um, yeah, man, JJ Fad, NWA, uh, EZ and them, um, DOC, all these different artists, man. We was, we was, it was just the amazing number of people that we used to be on tour with. Legendary artists, man. Run DMC, LL Cool J, Eric B and Rakim. We've performed with all these dudes, man, and connected with them. And, you know, these are dudes that I grew up watching on MTV, right? And then, like, all of a sudden to be at that young age kind of thrust into, yo, I'm like, on stage with these dudes and I'm, you know, part of their tours and, you know, whatever the case is, man, it was just a, a transformational type of experience. Right. You mentioned uh, watching your own TV raps and things of that nature, Posse on Broadway, 